Bueno, creo que ya empezamos con la Por si alguien lo quiere compartir también. Ya empezamos con la transmisión. De, ah, ya estamos en, en vivo, creo que, que en YouTube. Ah, so, thanks a lot, eh, Martina, for being here, for sharing with us this uh, presentation about your work, about uh, the last research that you've been doing. So we appreciate a lot that you, you want to share with the, the Institute and with, our, with the people, with the students, with our college, and everything that you were done. And first of all, I'm going to make an introduction of, of Martina, so everything knows a little about, about her. Uh, so, eh, bueno, Martina is Italiana, eh, nacida en, en Padua, hizo su carrera de grado y su maestría en Padua en, en Italia, y mm, la maestría la relación en psicología experimental y ciencia del cerebro, y también eh, hizo su, su maestría y su carrera de grado en, en, en esos temas, y terminó su doctorado en el año 2010 en sistemas neuronales y, y cognición en la Universidad eh, de Boston. Actualmente es investigadora en el Departamento de Ciencias Cognitiva y Neurociencia, y miembro de, 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 del, del Centro de Ciencias Visuales en la Universidad de Rochester, Anteriormente fue investigadora asociada en el Departamento de Psicología y Ciencias del Cerebro de la Universidad de, de Boston. Y bueno, como pueden checar en internet, tiene muchísimas publicaciones en la, sobre temas de, que tratan de relacionar, o hacer una intersección o, eh, entre la percepción, la acción, la atención, principalmente en el campo visual. Utiliza muchísimo en psicofísica visual, eye tracking, de alta revolución y movimientos de sacadas para investigar cómo la atención eh, modula el movimiento de los ojos y cómo se optimiza, eh, sí, cómo la atención optimiza eh, el, el escaneo que hacemos en el espacio visual. Y en esta charla, bueno, nos hablará un poco de estos temas, de cómo es la interacción entre eh, la atención y el movimiento de los ojos en la, en la escala de la, de la fobia, un poco como el título acá que está. Eh, está diciendo. Bueno, muchas gracias Martina por estar acá. Thanks a lot, Martina, for being here, for again for sharing with us uh, everything that you've been doing in the last years. So, um, thank you so much for yeah, for the intro, Roman. I I don't speak Spanish, but I I think I got catch here yeah. and there a few words. Uh, um, so yeah. Um, and thanks for uh, for having me here uh, today. Um, so just confirming the the, the screen, uh, the, the slides. You can see them, okay? Yeah, we are we are watching perfectly your your slides. Okay, perfect. Uh, good. So um, today we'll talk about the, the interplay of um, attention and eye movements at the foveal scale. Um, I start by um, giving a little bit of a background um, and uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have uh, questions. Um, good. So um, we, um, we know it's well established that the visual acuity is restricted to a very um, small region of the retina and uh, this region is known as the, um, the central fore or the foveola. And this is uh, really a special region because um, anatomically is different from uh, the rest of the retina. So it's um, in fact is free from capillaries and rods, and there are the uh, cone photoreceptors are most densely packed. Um, and this region uh, it, uh, covers only one degree of a visual angle um, of the entire visual field. Um, so to give you a feeling of how small that is, so that's about the size of an index finger nail. At our and so because um, uh, visual acuity and other visual function progressively deteriorates as we move away from this uh, um, central uh, region, um, then uh, humans uh, rely on a tight link uh, between uh, um, uh, behavior, glomotor behavior, and visual perception. Um, I'm not sure how the movie is coming through uh, Zoom, and maybe you see a little bit choppy, but here um, you have to see um, uh, seconds that humans make uh, uh, two or three times every second. That is for fast time movements that we make uh, to um, sample the visual scene in front of us and to uh, 
or move the objects of interest uh, at the very center of case where they can be a result of that distribution. Um, now, what is interesting is that even in the periods in between um, saccades, so during fixation, our eyes uh, continue to move. Um, and uh, here you can actually see uh, in the movie a zoom in um, a view of, uh, of the eye that shows um, the jitter of the eye during, uh, uh, during fixation. It's just a typical fixation period. Um, and so the presence of this constant motion of the eye um, suggests that there is an even tighter link between um, oculomotor behavior and visual perception that extends also to periods of fixations in between uh, saccades. So how much the, uh, does the eye move? How much actually the, the retina image moves um, during fixation? Um, well, let me just give you an example. So um, assume you're looking around the scene like this, let's just take a fixation period. Um, the, the blue dot, that the, the blue circle that you see here, um, that's about one degree in size. So that's about the, the input to the central survey if you're fixating there. And here is a reconstruction of the amount of motion the, uh, the retina um, is exposed to. So as you see um, during, during a typical fixation period, and so as you see, there is a substantial amount of motion that is going on. Um, that would be immediately noticeable if this was the result of uh, um, motion of stimuli in the external environment rather than self motion. Um, and uh, over a um, longer time period, like even um, 10 seconds of fixation, the eye can span an area that is about half um, square, um, half degree square. Um, so here you can see the, uh, this is an example of a 2D distribution of uh, gaze position from uh, one observer during sustained fixation um, period. Um, so it's, it's intriguing that the high is not, uh, is not stationary during fixation and that the term of fixation that is misleading, right? Because the eye keeps moving. Um, and uh, this motion is really the result of two types of eye movement. They are called fixational eye movement. And we distinguish primarily between uh, micro saccades, um, which are basically just like small saccades. They are, we define them as having a, a, an amplitude of less than alpha degree. So they basically maintain the fixated object uh, within the boundaries of the central foyer within the foyer. Um, and then in between micro saccades, they continuously jitter. Um, and that this um, motion, this lower motion is called ocular drift and it resembles a sort of um, random motion. Now, these type movements are referred to as uh, microscopic but, uh, because they are um, difficult to measure, to characterize precisely because they, of their, they are so small. But, from, uh, um, but that's from the experimental perspective. But from the perspective of a retina, they actually shift the during fixation the image over many photoreceptors. As, as, as you have seen before, they create a substantial amount of uh, motion, so they definitely have an impact on. Uh, uh, the, um, the encoding of the visual stimulus. Um, um, so in the first part of the talk, I mostly focus on the, the function um, of microsecants. They are linked with, uh, with attention, the control of attention at full scale. And then in the second part of the talk, I will also touch on uh, um, ocular drift and the uh, uh, functions of control. Um, uh, well, uh, so what about microscopes? Uh, um, uh, to which extent they, they can be controlled and what is their function? Um, uh, well, when microscopes were initially examined, the, um, the idea, the dominant view that was proposed at the time uh, was that their primary function. Martina, sorry, uh, I don't know why we are having some kind of problem with the, with the sound. Uh, oh, uh, sure. It, my sound? Yeah. It doesn't come. I, I'm not so sure if. Uh, because I believe that it was my problem, but Diana is writing the same. I'm not so sure. Um, yeah, it looks so okay from here, but uh, do you want me to do something on my hand? Yeah. 
Can you hear me okay? Or Yeah, I believe that improved now. Yeah. Diana is, is better now. Yeah. Uh, let's try. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, let me know if I need to change something on my end or if it's not working. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll just you know, catch up from where we left. So, um, what what is the functions of these uh, uh, microseconds? And let me just uh, take a look at it. Well, initially, according to the dominant view, um, the primary function of microscope was that of preventing image fading. Uh, during fixation. So the idea is that if uh, the image doesn't move on the retina um, during fixation, then eventually stimuli um, starts to fade away. And so the idea was that microsecards eventually help to refresh uh, the image, uh, um, to provide the image on, on the retina and prevent this uh, um, uh, fading to occur. Um, now, however, um, we, uh, one of our studies challenged this view because it showed that under condition that elicit, active elicit uh, visual fading, uh, the rate of microsaccades, um, instead of increasing uh, to control fading, actually decreases. Um, and so um, certainly microsaccades um, can be used by the system, by the, the visual system to um, contract the image fading, but eventually we think that's unlikely to be their main function. They probably, um, uh, they probably also play other roles, very important function in, um, in visual perception, um, especially uh, during normal viewing condition, uh, in which rather than just staring on a dot for several seconds, like it's cost very many, uh, studies that actually examine microsecounts. Um, we view complex <laughs> visual scenes uh, and, uh, and often the stimulus at the very center of gaze is rich uh, in details. So it's very much different from standing microsecounts in, uh, in a condition where the, the, the central stimulus is, uh, um, is deprived of this richness and, and the subject simply fixated on a, on a dot. So, this led us to further explore uh, microsecades in more natural conditions um, in which uh, subjects perform the spatial vision task, vision mode task. Um, <clears throat> and um, at the time, um, microsecades were considered to be um, detrimental um, or as a nuisance for this uh, um, fine spatial vision mode task. Um, and it was, it is that they had to be suppressed during uh, fine spatial visual motor tasks. Um, but in a seri um, series of studies that we conducted, uh, um, actually we showed that when subjects perform this type of tasks, microsecads accounts are um, quite frequent. And as I show you um, in the next slides, they are also very uh, well controlled. So what I'm showing here is um, um, the typical oculomotor behavior during a, a fine spatial um, visual motor task that we, we use in our experiment. So here, subjects were asked to uh, thread um, a needle in a virtual environment, especially on the display uh, on the monitor while controlling it with a, a remote controller. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the entire uh, stimulus was uh, um, was well within uh, the central fovea. So it was, really, it was really small. And the distance between the tip of the thread and the eye of the needle was just of uh, less than, than alpha degree. Um, the, the blue cross that you see here, it's uh, actually gaze uh, position recorded with high, with, um, high resolution and high precision. And, um, um, and all the jumps of the blue cross that you see in here in the movie, um, they basically represent microsecounds. Um, and so they are in the range of like 10 to 15 arc minutes. It's so a really, really tiny uh, uh, shift, um, faster shift. And our uh, microsecounds precisely, uh, as you see here, they precisely relocated the, uh, the gaze between the two objects that needed to be aligned. So here the subject was trying to align the thread with the eye of the knee. Um, now, before I go ahead and, and um, I you know, tell you about the other um, experiments uh, um, on microsecounds, we I just want to, to point out that the, the experiment, this experiment, as well as pretty much all the experiments that we presented today, 
um, require a quite high level of technological finesse and, um, and high precision eye tracking. Uh, but not only high precision eye tracking, also accurate gaze uh, uh, localization, because we, we want to know exactly where it, uh, the, the, um, the stimulus is, uh, uh, is located with respect to um, the, the center of gaze, which is a very small uh, region of the visual field that is less than uh, the one that is. And so to this end, we, um, we rely on a high precision dual booking image tracker that you see here in this picture. Now we, we most more recently developed um, a digital version of the, uh, the regional analog system. Um, and so this allows for high precision recording of high, high positions, and uh, um, particularly these uh, fixational uh, movements. Um, and, uh, and then we couple this system with um, a custom made uh, a system for case contingent display control um, uh, that allow us also to um, more accurately localize the, the line of size, uh, sight, um, which otherwise would not be possible with standard eye tracking. So all the studies I present today were, were based on this, uh, um, on this system. Um, so uh, after we, uh, we found that, uh, um, that the microsecalds can be finely controlled when the subject performs this uh, um, visual motor, fine spatial visual motor task, um, we wonder why, uh, why do we need, why the system needs such fine um, level of control? Um, uh, and then uh, why do we need to continuously shift the gaze, uh, um, given that the objects, the interesting objects in this case in the task were already within the center of the work at its highest. Um, and so um, to further examine the contribution of the subject, um, we ask the subject to perform um, a fine spatial discrimination task. Um, so here is what we did. We, um, ask the subjects to um, perform a, um, a fine visual discrimination task where stimuli were presented within uh, narrow apertures, as, as you see here. Um, so they were really small, small apertures, just um, um, seven by, by, um, uh, by five arc minutes in size. And within those apertures, we presented the ratings. Um, and the first one grading appeared on the left, and then uh, in the grading, another grading appeared on the right. Um, um, and we systematically um, uh, changed the, the distance of these uh, apertures from the um, uh, fixated location, from the central fixated location. Um, so we tested um, eccentricities of 5, 10, and 15 arc minutes. Um, so stimuli were presented at different eccentricity, but they were still within the central, um, the central focus. Um, the task of the subject was to tell whether these two sequentially presented rating were uh, tilted in the same way or whether they are tilted in opposite uh, ways. Um, so in one condition, um, uh, we to eliminate the, the influence of fixation on movements and we, use a technique that is called retinal stabilization. This is a technique that we can implement thanks to our is a, a contingent display system. Um, and what this means is that basically stimuli are moved in real time on the display uh, to compensate for the observer fixation eye movements. So that eventually they are maintained and fix the location um, on the retina and then eventually the desired eccentricity uh, within um, the, uh, the fovea. Um, despite the fact that the subject continuously moves um, the eyes. And then in another condition instead, um, subject normally view the stimuli. So uh, what this means is that stimuli were fixed on the display, but eventually uh, they move um, all over the, the fovea because of the physiological instability of the eye because of the station. And so what we found is that when stimuli were um, retinally stabilized, so when their eccentricity uh, was maintained constant uh, throughout the viewing time, well, performance decreased at the larger eccentricity test, so 10 or 15 arc minutes. Um, um, and so these uh, results already show that the fine special vision is not uniform um, 
across the central uh, foveum. But it starts to drop already fewer minutes away from the, the, the very center uh, preferred locus of fixation, where presumably acuity is, is highest. Um, and the results, importantly, look quite different in the normal viewing conditions. So, uh, in fact, in this case, uh, um, the uh, performance remain approximately flat at all eccentricity tested. Um, and uh, uh, now the, the, the main difference between this condition is that in one case, the stimulus was being the right at the right sensation, the stimulus was maintained at the, at the desired uh, eccentricities uh, within the central form. Uh, but in the normal viewing condition, the stimuli moved all over because of, uh, um, uh, of fixational movements, and in particular because of microcircuitry, so it might have moved a different uh, eccentricity. What we did is that we examined the oculomotor behavior of the uh, observer while they were performing the task. And so, what uh, what actually happened uh, in uh, in normal in their normal viewing conditions is that the subjects used microsaccades um, in a very um, um, they coordinated them very precisely. So here is just an example. Um, here is actually. Um, a reconstruction of what, what happened in, in one typical trial. So the, the red the traces represent microscans, um, and the blue traces represent the So, um, and the yellow arrow here in the, in the movie actually um, indicates where the, the target, the grating was presented. So it was presented to the left and then on the right. And so you see um, how um, some jets uh, perform these microsaccades and shift the gaze back and in a very timely manner, depending on where and when the stimulus was presented. This behavior was very systematic, pretty much at all the eccentricity tested, particularly at the larger one of 10 or 15. Um, and um, um, and microsecond, most of the time, they were precise, so they landed precisely on um, the uh, location where the stimulus was presented. Very few times they happened. Sorry, sorry, Martina. Mm -hmm. Ali, do, do you want to, to say something? Sure, yes. Yeah, if you have a question, just feel free to. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask whether, I mean, um, well, two things. First, mm -hmm. can the subject control their microsecat? I mean, for example, can you tell them, do not do microsecat? And do they do actually, I mean, reduce the amount of microsecat? Or is it or is it something like that? And the second one is, you say here that uh, small diffusive like movement is like ocular drift. Do you think that's something that has to do with like the anatomy of the eye or is it something that has to do with, I don't know, is it something active or is it something passive? Um, yeah, so all great questions. And, and um, uh, as we go on with the slides, we'll, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll address basically um, uh, all of them, but just to give you a, a brief preview. So about the first question that you ask, whether we can suppress microsaccades uh, um, intentionally or somehow we are some under, under uh, some control. Um, well, yes, um, there are um, studies showing that uh, subjects can suppress microsaccades. Um, and uh, we, I, you know, you will see in a few slides uh, um, that uh, we have a quite a fine control over uh, microsaccades. They, they are also influenced by, um, you know, other cognitive and higher order uh, factors. So, so you will see more in the next slides that will address this question. And then regarding the second questions about drift and how it's related, uh, I guess the question is how it's related or if it is related to the eye anatomy. I guess um, that's a very interesting question, um, and we don't have an answer to that. But uh, um, it's something that I'm, I'm very much interested in, and um, um, uh, we actually now are expanding our line of research to image the the, the retina uh, of the of the subject. So uh, hopefully that will help us to you know find an answer to that question. But yeah, it's it's not a known, um, and also drift is you know, less control, at least it's not, might not be controlled as precisely microscopes, but it's also under uh, under control by the uh, visual motor system. So yeah, and I will, you know, we'll show you um, later on in the presentation. Okay, so um, 
because if you don't have other questions, then um, basically what we concluded from this study is that, the, well, first of all, the important finding is that the fine spatial vision is not uniform across the central phobia. Um, and uh, even uh, with the tiny displacement from peripheral locus of fixation, um, we, we see a drop in, in performance. And eventually, microsaccades um, act as a mechanism to compensate this limitation by repositioning uh, the stimuli, the detail, uh, in an optimal way on the preferred locus of fixation where it is highest. Um, so rather than simply being like a refreshing mechanism, they actually are precisely controlled and they can compensate for no uniform vision across the central phobia. And also these findings made us realize how understanding microsaccades and how they are controlled can help us to then understand better the mechanism underlying fine spatial vision across the central phobia. However, despite these findings, um, uh, and this brings back, uh, I guess, Anil's uh, question, um, according to the predominant view, even nowadays, uh, microsecants are mostly regarded as involuntary. Um, but are they really uh, involuntary? Um, well, we need to look back to work that has been done in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, and uh, they show that even the smallest microsaccades uh, could be performed voluntarily. And that simply can suppress microsaccades on, on demand. And then following up on that, um, on that work, we, uh, we and other, other uh, work as well have shown that the microsaccades can be performed on demand. So the subjects can perform very precise microsaccades on demand to uh, a visual target. Um, and, uh, um, and they can be, um, so they can be precisely controlled and uh, um, uh, with intention. And let me just show you, uh, this, this is um, an example of a subject playing uh, a mini version of an annoyed topo game. I'm sure if you're familiar with this game, but basically you have to shift the, uh, the boxes from one all, uh, to, uh, to the next uh, following a specific order. So, like one, one, the bigger, uh, the, the bigger box of boxes cannot be stuck on the top of the smaller one. Um, so anyway, here the subject is performing this task using their eye movements uh, and the stimulus is miniaturized. So as you see uh, on the scale bar on the top, the entire stimulus covered only one degree of visual angle. So it was, they were very tiny. The blocks were just few arcminutes in size. Um, and all this, um, so the, the dot that you see that is blue is actually gaze position. Uh, and um, all this uh, shift of the gaze, so they basically micro seconds in the order of uh, 10, 15 or 20 arcminutes that the subject is using very precisely and uh, intentionally <laughs> to, to move the blocks from one location to, um, to another. Um, so eventually uh, this shows that the, when subjects are not forced to maintain fixation as it happens in many, uh, in many uh, experiments where subjects are simply fixating on a dot, um, then uh, um, in, in normal uh, conditions uh, with more complex uh, uh, formal stimuli, microsecades are not voluntary, uh, but rather they are voluntary, they are not a random movement, they are precise and finely uh, controlled. Um, so these findings also <clears throat> brought up another question, which is, uh, um, can, so are these microsecants um, simply the result, the outcome of a purely bottom-up compensatory mechanism? Um, so in the previous studies, there were stimuli that pop up at different location of the move. That, um, so can they, um, are they simply the outcome of a purely bottom-up uh, compensatory mechanism, or can they also be guided by other top-down factors, uh, um, like the, uh, driven by the demands of the task? Uh, um, and can they be used in normal condition to explore uh, complex flow of stimuli in the same way that large saccades explore the larger scene? So we examine this question, and um, um, more as more complex stimuli, we use human faces. Uh, um, in fact, it's, it's, um, it's very well known that at the larger scale, when we examine faces, um, we, we, we scan faces with our eye movements following 
specific uh, uh, visual uh, um, scanning strategies depending on the task. And um, we are also familiar with viewing faces from a range of different distances, right? So for example, if I have a person right in front of, in front of me, just a few meters away from me, then their face may cover several degrees of visual angle. But if I'm looking at somebody standing many meters away from me, uh, then their face may um, be just one degree, right? just for one degree of visual angle. So if it's stayed on the face, the face will basically cover the whole uh, central fovea and the distance between the different features in the face. It's just a few arguments. So what happened when I just fixate on, on this uh, complex forward stimuli? Um, so to understand this, um, we um, asked the subject to perform two different tasks with the same set of stimuli that were presented at the forward scale. So in one um, task, we ask subject to judge gaze uh, direction. So whether a face was looking at them or whether it was looking away. And in another case, using the same set of faces, we, um, we asked the subject to uh, perform a different task, so whether the face was smiling at them or not. Uh, and again, just to remind you that the, um, the face itself was just one degree visual angle, so as if you're looking at somebody standing many meters away from you. And we designed it so that the distance between the features that are relevant for both this task was the same um, from the initially fixated look. Um, and in this task, we examine uh, with high resolution with our system, uh, the oculomotor behavior uh, of the observers. Um, and here is um, a reconstruction of uh, um, uh, what, what happened in the task. This is uh, the average um, 2D distribution of case position across, uh, uh, across subjects. Um, and uh, it shows how it evolves, how it changes, how this position is moved throughout the task uh, from uh, the beginning, from a stimulus onset. Uh, and so it's clear that despite the small size of the stimulus, um, the fact that the object was already centered optimally within the field to perform both tasks, um, some actively during fixation, so they were maintaining fixation um, on the face, so they were. Um, they were actually actively exploring them. And not only the, the strategies they used to explore the face was different depending on the task. And these exploratory strategies uh, uh, were really carried out by, uh, by microsaccades. In fact, uh, um, when we looked at uh, how microsaccades are controlled in this task, we found that uh, when some had to judge um, the expression of the face, once so of the microsaccades landed on the mouth and uh, on the eyes. Uh, but when they were to judge gaze direction, then this pattern flipped completely and then most of the microsaccades landed on, uh, on the eyes. So um, resembling very much what happens at the larger scale when we explore um, uh, human faces. Um, and in a separate experiment, um, what we did is that we uh, systematically compared the visual examination of the faces at the full scale um, and then at the larger scale when now the face cover several degrees of visual angle. And so it extended to the parafovia function. So this is this uh, in this task, the subject simply have to judge facial expression. So they have to tell whether the face was uh, expressing some emotion or, or, or whether it was neutral. Um, and uh, what we found is uh, quite interesting because we found an idiosyncratic behavior uh, across the subjects uh, um, that uh, was reflected also at the foot of the so Let me just show you some examples. So, um, for example, here is a subject who always looked at the mouth when performing this task and never at the eyes. And then, interestingly, we see it, it, a very similar pattern when the same subject view the stimuli uh, at the full scale. Here is another example of an observer um, showing the opposite behavior. So they are, instead of looking at the mouth, they're mostly looking at the eyes and even at the bias uh, for, um, for the right eye. And then we see exactly the same happening when they view the stimuli at the full scale. And the most interesting, the, the was, um, uh, also a small subset of the observers that we tested who did not explore the faces so they basically just maintain fixation uh, at the, in the nose region, the very center, um, and they didn't perform many, uh, many saccades or micro saccades. Um, 
well. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, uh, this behavior also was uh, replicated for uh, um, at the corporate scale. Um, so, um, so overall, these results uh, suggest that even individual strategies and visual information are preserved across the scale, all the way to um, the, the small scale of the um, so um, they also show that the active uh, visual exploration extends to um, this uh, scale and uh, it's driven by the goal of justice, by this, as indeed argued also by top-down factors. Um, and uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the detail of the stimulus at the center of, uh, of gaze uh, are explored with the strategies that are very similar to strategies used uh, um, when exploring stimuli at the larger um, the larger scale. Um, good, now um, let me just shift the gear a little bit and now that I show you how much microsecats can be controlled and the, um, the factors driving them. We all know, right, that there is a tight link between uh, eye movements and uh, attention. So this brings us to the question of whether uh, attention can also be um, selectively shifted across the fovea. So can we control attention down to this scale? Um, so this question was actually examined in the past a little bit, but um, our previous work didn't really account for fixational eye movements. Um, and um, we now know that they would be quite a confounding um, because they keep moving the stimulus over the fovea. So it would be very difficult to, to test the covered attention. Um, in this uh, setting without controlling for these same movements. So if attention can be finely tuned at this scale, uh, um, well, this may be crucial because uh, it can further enhance our ability to discriminate uh, detail at selected locations across the central area. So um, to address this question, uh, we uh, run a miniature version of a typical spatial tuning task. Uh, um, uh, as you see here. And um, uh, here, basically, the whole stimuli that normally represented the larger scale uh, were reduced to fit within one degree of visual angles. Um, and um, uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with this type of task, uh, it's, it's just a standard task that is used to test uh, attention. So initially, um, the subject fixate at the center of this, uh, of this array where it the, the black dot is, uh, and then we present a cue, um, briefly a cue, a central cue that tells the subject where the stimulus, the target is more likely to appear in which box the stimulus more likely to appear. Um, and then after uh, a certain delay, um, the target appears in one of these four boxes. And the, in this case, uh, it was just one, uh, like a tiny bar, so it was like three high acuity stimulus and subject have to tell the orientation of this bar. Um, so, um, in the, what we found is that um, once we control for fixational line movements in this uh, context, so we made sure that subjects were not performing microsecants um, and that the stimuli remained at a fixed um, eccentricity between the viola, well, we found that covered and covered endogenous attention. Uh, can be selectively shifted as little as 20 arc minutes across the uh, central phobia. And eventually it enhances um, fine spatial discrimination at this scale. And it also reduces reaction times for stimuli that are present at the attended location. And we also see a cost uh, at the unattended location. So performance is actually worse um, for stimuli that are presented just a few arc minutes away within the phobia, but they are uh, unattended. Um, and uh, we also, in a more recent uh, study, we also showed that uh, um, uh, also foveally localized exogenous cue, um, so exogenous attention, which is a, a form of involuntary attention, automatic attention, uh, also leads to fast and transient enhancement of high acuity vision at selected uh, foveal, uh, foveal locations. And uh, this enhancement eventually we found is uh, followed by a reverse pattern that is characterized by an enhancement of fine spatial vision at the other initially unattended locations within the fovea. So basically what these findings are, are showing is that both voluntary and involuntary attention 
can be fine-tuned uh, within the central, uh, the central fold. And this has an impact uh, um, and it enhances visual perception at the attended location. And it reduces instead um, visual discrimination and the visual function at the unattended location. Um, so these findings are mostly regards covert attention, so attention that is shifted without um, eye movements. So this, uh, this led us to examine more the interplay of attention eye movements at forward scale. So what happens uh, basically to forward vision right before uh, the onset of a microsaccade when pre-saccadic attention is normally engaged. Um, so uh, in a recent work, we actually addressed this question and we found that the benefits of microsaccades for foveal vision are not only restricted, as I showed you earlier in the presentation, by the execution of uh, uh, microsaccades that brings a stimuli closer to the preferred locus of fixation within central foveal, but they also occur before the onset of the microsaccade during the preparation time. So let me just tell you a little bit about this study here. Uh, we ask subject to report again the orientation of um, uh, fine spatial stimuli that were briefly flashed before the onset of the microsecans. The subject maintain fixation at the center of this array of stimuli that you see here. The stimuli could appear at eight possible uh, locations, and they all were about 20 or minutes away from the uh, central initially fixated location. Uh, so the entire array was presented within uh, central form. Um, as subjects maintain fixation, then eventually a, a, sorry, a saccade signal is presented that instructs the subject to shift um, uh, the gaze at the that location. Um, and again, because we are at such this small scale, the subject naturally use micro saccades to shift and right before the microscope is performed, we, uh, we, we present, we briefly present uh, um, uh, stimuli on, on the display at all these locations. These are just tiny bars that are tilted uh, um, 45 degrees to the left or to uh, the right. Um, and then um, eventually my, uh, my microsecond is performed by the subjects. And, uh, and then after um, they land from the microseconds, we present a response cue. And we basically ask them to report the orientation of the stimulus at the, um, uh, the location indicated by the response cue. And now it's important to, to note that the direction indicated by the signal signal doesn't predict the, the, the cue, the, the location of the response cue. So here, let me just show you, this is a reconstruction of an actual typical trial. Uh, the blue traces here represent uh, uh, ocular drift. So here's the sun just start by fixating at the center, then this, the microsecond cue up here. Um, so some just start to prepare the microsecond that the stimuli are presented quickly, and then eventually some just shift the gaze. They are very precise in doing this. Uh, um, and uh, at the end of, the, of the, um, the trial, we present the response cue and we ask some to report the orientation of the stimulus previously presented. So um, what, uh, what are uh, our findings show? Well, um, we found that visual sensitivity was announced at the microsecond target locations in a very selective way. Um, and eventually it abruptly decreased uh, close to chance level to the other locations that were tested, even if they were just uh, uh, 15 earth minutes or 16 earth minutes away from the goal of microsecond. Um, so, um, not only sensitivity was enhanced at the microscope goal, um, but also the reaction times were faster uh, at that location selectively within the central form. Um, and uh, what we also find is that uh, right before the onset of the microsecond, not only sensitivity at the target location of the microsecond is enhanced, but sensitivity also drops at the preferred locus of fixation, so the very center of case where normally uh, sensitivity is highest. So we, we basically before the microsecond, uh, sensitivity is reshaped quite drastically uh, within the central fold. And eventually this effect um, um, evolves and it builds up over time and it's highest uh, um, around 150 milliseconds before the onset of a microsecond. So to summarize this basically, uh, fine, sp fine sp 
find spatial sensitivity um, is not only a known uniform across the central fovea, but it also changes in space and time every time a microsaccade is performed, as shown here. So basically, every time before an ounce of microsaccade sensitivity is announced at the target location, it drops um, elsewhere and also at the um, preferred locus of fixation. Um, now, um, so far I show you microsecond mostly in the context of experiment, rather artificial tasks, but um, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what happens to microsecond in more natural everyday tasks. For example, reading, right? We read all, all the time. Um, do microsecond play a role in reading? How are they controlled when we read? Do we make microsecond when we read? Sort of. In fact, for many years, microsecads have been ignored in the reading literature. But in a recent study, we found that actually when we read, microsecads are quite um, uh, are quite often um, uh, performed. So here is just an example of the eye movements of an observer while reading. Um, and all the pink lines that you see here, they represent microsecads. And so it turns out that uh, when you're reading even for like 15 minutes, Eventually, this leads to an average of 270 microseconds across subjects. So, um, so that's uh, uh, quite a significant amount. And to me, it also means that, well, probably they are there not just by, just by uh, mistake, but they are probably playing some, uh, some role during reading. And in fact, not only microseconds are frequent when we read, but uh, um, they also follow a pattern that is substantially different from what we see when we simply maintain fixation on a point. Um, so uh, here is the distribution of microseconds directions and amplitude when you simply fixate on, on a dot during fixation. And here is how um, they are how they are during the reading. So uh, they usually tend to be a little bit larger and they are mostly clustered um, around the horizontal meridian, but in particular, uh, they tend to go uh, leftward, um, which is quite interesting. Um, and so these graphs here illustrates better these trends. Um, in fact, uh, uh, whereas during sustained fixation, leftward left and rightward microsaccades occur quite free, equally frequently. When we read, the majority of microsecads are leftwards, which is interesting because it means that they're basically going against the direction of reading. Um, and also the probability of uh, vertical microsecads, which would shift the gaze to the wrong line, also sharply reduced during uh, reading compared to uh, fixation. Um, and uh, what is interesting is that this pattern that I just showed you um, is present uh, uh, was present specifically for microsaccades. So we reported specifically in association with microsaccades, so saccades smaller than us. If we move the saccades that are slightly larger, so uh, up to one degree, we don't see the same patterns. Most of the larger saccades are progressive. They move in the direction of reading. But specifically, microsaccades have to do with the, um, the opposite. Um, now, it's still unclear um, the role of microsecond in readings, but this result clearly suggests that the microsecond during reading are not random and probably play an important role. Um, now, um, I would like to go through um, uh, the second part of the presentation, last part of the presentation, and talk briefly about um, ocular uh, drift and the contribution of ocular drift. Because so far, I, I always talked about microsecads, but as we said before, there's also another component of fixation and um, eye movement, which is ocular uh, drift. Um, and that is also important for fine spatial vision. And um, um, maybe humans are not capable of controlling drift as precisely as they do with microseconds, but the drift is under some level of uh, control. Uh, and this was shown also by research conducted in the past. So drift, as you see here, is a sort of like a, almost a random walk. Um, uh, it moves uh, slowly um, and uh, quite erratically. Um, and we recently showed that ocular drift is actually quite controlled. Um, uh, when we study drift under head-free uh, condition. In fact, most of the time drift is studied when the head is fixed, uh, right? This is an example of uh, how our subjects are in our experiments. So um, we fix the head to eliminate any um, 
interfering factors from head movements. Um, but in reality, uh, the, the viewing conditions are very different, right? Our head is free uh, to move. Um, and uh, during, uh, um, even when we are sitting still, uh, the head performs more uh, eye movements similar to the eye, there are more like fixation or head movements. Um, and uh, what we found is in that in this condition, when the head is free, it's basically uh, ocular drift and small uh, fixation on the head movements, they compensate for each other. Um, and uh, they eventually maintain the retinal motion during fixation within a range that is optimal for, um, uh, for, for vision. So if we didn't have this compensation, we would experience a lot more retinal motion that would be uh, uh, way destructive for a uh, fine spatial vision. And uh, now based on many studies that were conducted in our lab, particularly by Rucci and colleagues, we now know that the modulation of ocular drift enhance high uh, spatial frequency. So let me just explain this briefly. So let's suppose we have a white noise input and then we jitter it based on the dynamics of ocular drift. Uh, um, then the, if we look at the power spectrum of the input coming to the retina at the non-zero temporal frequencies, well, it would look something uh, like here, like this. Um, so in this particular case, for example, the power peaks around uh, 10 cycles per degree. And so what this means is that this type of drift optimizes visibility of stimuli in that range of spatial frequencies. Um, and the uh, drift eventually uh, enhances a different range of spatial or high spatial frequencies depending on how much it displaces the image on the retina. So particularly smaller drift will shift this peak uh, to over higher and higher spatial frequencies. So the quantified amount of ocular drift here in this study, we uh, measure the drift diffusion coefficient, which is, uh, um, it, we measure how rapidly the line of sight tends to move away from its current location. Um, and um, uh, it turns out that uh, there is substantial variability in the diffusion coefficient uh, across the subjects, so in how subjects move their eyes as a consequence of ocular drift. And it varies uh, of a factor of four across subjects, as you see here. So there's a substantial variability. And so we reason that if indeed uh, if the enhances uh, eye spatial frequency in a different range, depending on um, you know, how much people drift, that then uh, maybe we'll see also different levels of eye acuity. Vision. So we tested this. Um, using high acuity stimuli uh, that you see here. So we simply ask the subject to identify the digit, uh, discriminate the digit present at the very central phase uh, at the limits of the visual acuity. Uh, we use an adaptive procedure, so we change the stimulus size and until we find the right threshold. And uh, what we find is that um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, there is a relationship between uh, the stroke width threshold, which is basically the acuity of subjects, and uh, their ocular drift, how much they drift. Uh, in particular, we found a, a, a significant relationship. So um, that the um, subjects with a smaller diffusion coefficient also have higher uh, visual, uh, visual acuity, characterized by higher visual acuity. Um, and so basically ocular drift predicts the visual acuity in a way that is consistent with the idea that uh, different range of high spatial frequency will be enhanced based on the amount of ocular drift fixation. So this, this also indicates that the instability and physiological instability of the eye during fixation, which is uh, often ignored, uh, both in clinical and experimental evaluation of acuity is actually uh, important. Um, and so now just to conclude, basically what we're showing here is that vision is an intrinsically active process, even during fixation. We have a remarkable control, uh, oculomotor control at this scale, not just for microscales, but also for drift. Uh, the vision the central fovea is non-uniform, uh, non um, and eventually microscales compensate for this non-uniformity um, and enhance by spatial vision, both and microsecond just in different ways. Um, and that the division across the central fovea is modulated continually in space and time by attention and by fixation. Um, so, uh, acute division is not just a mere consequence of 
basically placing a stimulus at the center of gaze, but it's really the outcome of a more of like a complex synergy of motor, cognitive, and attentional processes. And uh, finally, I would like to thank the uh, members of the lab, particularly those that contributed to the work that I presented today, my collaborators, and as well as uh, my, uh, my sponsors that uh, supported this, uh, uh, this research. And uh, I'm open for questions now. Okay, so the first question we have was posted on the YouTube um, stream. And it asked, and, and maybe this was uh, addressed in the, the, these final 10 minutes of the talk. Uh, it was made by Jose Vergara de la Fuente, who used to work in, in this institute. And it says, recently it has been shown that the fixation of human gaze is offset from the foveal center. Does this offset change or affect the ocular drifting results? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, so what this means is that basically the, I guess what you're referring to is that the, the, um, the peak condensity in, in the retina uh, within the foveola, it's not that the, uh, at the same location of the preferred retina locus, which is the location the subject chose to fixate. So there is um, a pretty systematic offset that is recorded across the subjects and there are also individual differences in this. Uh, um, how does this influence this drift? Well, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I don't know. We don't, so far we didn't, uh, we don't, we didn't have the possibility to examine uh, uh, the link between uh, uh, this behavior and, uh, and foveal anatomy, which I think it's very interesting. And, um, but, but hopefully we'll, be able to address this question soon. Um, and yeah, so there is what, what is interesting that we see a lot of variability also in the pattern of drift. Um, so it will be interesting to see how it is related to That's these factors. Well, Jose, thanks. If you want to post a follow up question, you can do so in the YouTube too. Uh, we're also fielding questions in the Zoom chat if, everyone, if anybody wants to put their questions there. I have a question. Meanwhile, other questions pop up. Uh, also about the drift, has, has there been an, any, um, so I, I don't know much about this, this area of research, but has there been any links between uh, like whole body motor preferences? So dominance, for example, red, like right versus left-handed people and their ocular drift? Because for example, in the, in the normal fixation condition, there is slightly less leftwards drift than rightwards drift. It doesn't appear to be a significant difference, but that caught my eye. Um, uh, you mean in, in the data that I presented? Yes. In the, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we didn't systematically look uh, at this. We also record monocularly. Um, so um, it might be that uh, we see a slightly different pattern if we record the other eye, and maybe somehow this is um, this is related. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, if there is a, some uh, some relationship between these two these factors, yeah. I guess, yeah, because yeah. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of these effects that, like the, the whole body is the, like the body is taken as a whole for a lot of motor systems, so there might be an influence, uh, for example, with dominance, right, which is like very uh, strong in humans. Yeah, yeah, I think it's likely. Also, I think we learn a lot more when we start studying these uh, eye movements in the more natural settings, like when the head is free or when we move around and we have the, the precision, enough precision to study them um, in, in, in head or not, yes, of course, in natural yes. conditions. And so there Absolutely. are a lot of limitations now. But Yeah, because humans in natural conditions, we are very um, biased, right, in our movement. We prefer turning yeah. a certain way or moving our heads. Yeah. But like the, the reading um, data is, is very interesting. Like this observation of microcircuits that go backwards is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, us in academics, we read all the time. So we'll everybody will probably go out of this, this talk and notice it when they're reading papers. Yeah. <laughs> <later today. laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see any questions in the chat. Or, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martina, for your talk. It was really. Great, and I like a lot your animation and everything you present. And Anil has a, another question now. I was very interested uh, about um, with the data that you presented about drift. Anil, was, could you could you move closer to the microphone? You're a little bit low on the volume. I see, yeah. See, so you're Anil. Okay. 
Yeah, so I was wondering whether um, you have looked or made measurements of the drift in both eyes. I mean, I wonder if the drift is, uh, to what extent it is co uh, conjugated, which means, I mean, which would mean something more central. And also I was wondering, because uh, I've, I've seen um, this idea of trying to model um, the eye movements as a continuous attractor. And so would it, I mean, would it mean that sort of like adding noise to that signal? I mean, I, I don't know if you've heard that idea of having that, I mean, I guess you have. Yeah, but I wonder how you, you think the drift would be controlled, I mean, as a, a sort of like a noise in the system. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, okay, very interesting question. So um, drift is, um, uh, when we look at drift in the two eyes, we have done that. So um, what we see is that if you look at drift, um, when the head is fixed in the two eyes, it's, uh, um, it's not correlated. So the two eyes move in different ways. Um, yeah. But when we look at drift uh, in head-free condition, that's why I feel like it's important to study the movement in natural conditions, then the drift in the two eyes is highly correlated. Um, and the reason why it's highly correlated is because they compensate for fixational head movements. Um, so they compensate for fixational movements, but the compensation is not perfect, and it results in a residual amount of retinal motion, which is weakly correlating the two eyes. So, Normally during fixation in natural war, like binocular fixation, um, we do have uh, retinal motion in the two eyes, but it's not exactly uh, the same. So the, amount, the overall amount is, is comparable, but uh, the, the specific trajectories that the two eyes follow, um, or not the two eyes, but the, the stimuli follow on the retina, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's different, it's slightly different. And um, uh, yeah, so the, going back to your question, the fact that the, um, you know, the two eyes move together uh, to compensate for fixational head movements, um, suggests that there is some, you know, more control, more central control of drift system, just sort of like a random noise process that the system uh, cannot control. Wow, thank you. I don't know if there is another question. I, I, I don't think those in chat yet, but Roman, do you wanna? No, no, I, I was wondering what, what is the, the reason that there is so much uh, diversity or if there is any idea, hypothesis, why there are so much diversity across the, the subject in the diffusion coefficient? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a very good question. So we are also after the question, why do you see, it's almost, um, I always think about it as a sort of like a finger fingerprint. Um, so every subject has a different drift, quite different diff drift partner is also constant over time. You can almost tell which subject you're looking at just by looking at their drift pattern. Um, why do we have this diversity? Well, again, we don't know. It could be, um, my, my thought is that it could be related to um, the, um, an, the anatomy of the retina, the fovea, uh, the central fovea, then the, the arrangement of the cone mosaic. We, we also know that there is a lot of variability across subjects in uh, the, the steepness of, uh, uh, the cone, um, uh, of the cone density across the central fovea, um, and, uh, and also in the peak uh, cone density uh, at the, at the preferred locus of fixation. At the, it varies quite a bit across subjects. So uh, I wonder how these two uh, things are, are related, especially given the, the findings that we have that uh, the, the amount of drift is related to uh, or can predict that, um, the high acuity. So yeah, still still open question and I have an answer yet, but. <laughs> so so your, your hypothesis would be anatomical, right? There's something in the structure of the retina. Yeah, exactly. So it's related to basically the, the, the cone density the, the space and the spacing uh, between cones that is different across subjects and maybe some subjects benefit more from larger drift than others. Very interesting. Jose, Jose, do you have any questions? Jose? Yes, I have a question. He's having trouble putting his, his microphone on, but so, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, so your guess, Martina, your guess is uh, uh, answering or basing your answer that, that you gave to us now. 
is a, is more a genetic or is more anatomical the, the reason why we have some uh, differences in the, the diffusion uh, coefficient or I don't know like if there are like genetical yeah fine oh, okay well yeah that's a uh... It's difficult to tell at this point. Uh, it's also, we know very little about how drift evolves uh, through, uh, through age, right? So is it different okay. in, uh, um, you know, in kids compared to, to adults and as you age, um, there's very little, it's nothing <laughs> known. So uh, I don't know if it remains constant over time or if it changes, I have the feeling that you know, especially if we are, we are facing things like myopia or other eye disease, it might change quite uh, uh, quite a bit with, with age. Yes, yeah, so actually. Do you, hear, do you hear me now? Do you hear yes. me now? Yes, okay. we can hear. You. Okay. Uh, I wonder if in your samples of people you have uh, analyzed trained trained people, for example, like snipers from the army, like a microscopist. I mean, because they have this little tiny yeah. lens to focus on, right. and, uh, yeah. and if the good sniper is a gold medal in the Olympics, is different than yeah. me, for example, that I never have shoot anything. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a project that we it has been a while we wanted to do. I just we need to find the right uh, right subjects, but yeah. So what happens uh, in um, in special populations that are trained, like snipers is a great example, right? Um, are their drift different? And also drift or microseconds, and also, I guess the, the other questions that uh, you know comes after this is to which extent can you train these same movements? Can you um, you know optimize them? Can can people be trained to make uh, to, to change their drift pattern, microseconds pattern, uh, to perform better in certain tasks? Um, so, um, yeah, because yeah, the, training, it might the, even be contextual, right? You, yeah, you can, but, yeah, but the, the perception is so dependent on the motor system here that yeah. is, there is a continuous feedback on I mean, top down and bottom up uh, yeah. flow of, of activation. So, yeah. the trained people, I mean, for some reason, one guy is very good, and, and the non trained is, is not that good. I mean, you have to train that in, in order to 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 get the target, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And also, I, I have yeah. seen in a lot of microscopy. I mean, the old micros, microscopes. Um, I saw a lot of pathologists in during my medical school, mm -hmm. and all of them, while they were looking the the microscope because they did that all the all the day. I mean, while they were looking at the microscope, they were moving the head all the time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And they were moving the head around the, the oculars. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now with the screens and high resolution techniques, mm -hmm. we don't use these, uh, right. yeah. The, yeah. the oculars very much, but yeah. these old pathologies were always moving their heads. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. and. Um, and also, um, there are some cases of patients that um, uh, have um, uh, their eyes immobilized. So because of some pathologies, they cannot move their eyes. And so they also don't have fixation on eye movements. And so it has been reported that they basically develop um, a fixation on eye movements that, that kind of follow a, a similar, so they kind of shake. <laughs> Their, their head following a, a pattern that's to some extent similar to what normally fixational eye movements do in in a normal in a, a normal um, in a normal population. Um, so yeah, it, it looks like the system uh, can modulate basically the amount of uh, um, uh, of, of um, motion that, that that enter like the amount of retinal motions. Uh, in the in the visual uh, in the visual input and that can have a, an impact definitely on visual perception and maybe the system can optimize it with using drift and other mechanisms and uh, try to optimize this uh, motion based on the task that uh, is being performed. Hero, do you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah, I have a, I have a couple of questions now that we have. Uh... 
move towards this area of the conversation. So the first two would be would be related to these uh, switching the subjects, right? So so using different subjects. One would be using people who have a like common pathologies, right? Like uh, so that that use glasses for different things, like. Um, I forget the name right now, but myopia and astigmatism and all these different ways in that the eye can be deformed that you need glasses. So mm -hmm. I, I think that I mean, have you have you had had that? Because that would be an easier way to try to like relate maybe very mm -hmm. broad yeah. differences in anatomy to patterns yeah. in drift and ocular movement. And yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, it's definitely a direction we are moving toward the now um, more like cl clinical also to, to test the drifting clinical populations. And so- um, no, Because it might be easier to get a lot of people who use glasses than a lot of snipers, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so, and the, yeah, exactly. There are a lot of people using glasses. So we haven't really tested specifically people with glasses. The, the, the tricky thing is that, you know, when you wear glasses, um, well, we cannot run experiments with people wearing glasses uh, because our eye tracker doesn't work. So we will have to run run experiment with contact lenses or or, or, or maybe like without correction. less severe versions of these, like with yeah. small. Um, mm -hmm. For example, I use glasses, yeah. but I have a very small like like. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. It would definitely be interesting. Um, and I could definitely see without. Like, I could perform, for example, your experiment mm -hmm. without the glasses, right? Yeah. But I still yeah. know that my that my eye is, has a specific type of uh, deformation, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, could be that in these people, the drift is, uh, you know, it's, it's different or, you know, it changed that uh, compared to like before they start. In specific directions beyond the normal variation, right? Beyond, that would be the hope. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I would think. Uh, I mean, yeah. So like, for example, now we're doing is uh, in the lab, uh, uh, we're also looking at the um, myopia, for example. Um, uh, so um, to see how drift is characterized in this population. Um, and well, uh, but there's a second part to this question would be like, <laughs> what, what about other uh, like animal models, right? So not, not only a human animal, but like, because you mentioned like the evolution of uh, drift across age, right? Like mm -hmm. the life of a human. We could also look at the, like the literal evolution of drift across species, right? Oh, because sure. we have yeah. different shapes of eyes and like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that would be a way <laughs> yeah. to relate also very big morphological changes to maybe big changes in drift. Yeah, that's uh, definitely interesting. Um, we, well, I mean, drift has been studied with the, uh, with macaques, monkeys. Uh, and it has been shown that it's quite similar uh, to what we see in humans, both drift and microsecants. Um, uh, there are other species, well, like for example, um, the mouse um, doesn't have, uh, you know, saccans or, or micro saccans, um, but it's, it has um, uh, a tremor of the eye that's been shown recently that might, um, that might be, um, you know, somehow related to uh, the drift that we, that we see in the uh, so um, yeah, yes. there are definitely species different. Eagles, right? Yeah, yeah, and it depends also on whether these animals have, you know, foveated or not. Sometimes they have a lot of phobia. Or they have yeah, probably the issue, for example, with eagles is that they have two phobias, right? That would be an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, these are all very interesting. Uh, but it would be interesting because it's hard to to, to study, but yeah. Uh, we'll and, and my final just question, more more open, would be like, what would be your ideal like natural experiment, like not like in a in a natural setting, like if you could do any kind of tracking with any kind of. Yeah, well, I mean, I would like to study um, how these like, movements are in in a normal uh, conditions. You know, when we move around, we interact with other people, or we do some uh, natural tasks like reading, but reading, you know, with the, with the head in normal condition, not like, I mean, reading in, in front of the display is never so natural, right? So um, this would be probably a task I would uh, uh, look for, or maybe looking at the things from far, from distance, because that's also when you you need probably uh, micro and, and drift the most uh, when you analyze the small uh, details. Well, thank you. Oh. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thanks for all your questions. 
Jerónimo seems very interested in, in your research topic. So I don't know if there is any other question in the, from the people, or someone that so wants. Nothing yet in chat, so nothing yet in YouTube or Zoom, but anybody want to raise their hands or open up their mics? Yeah. Anybody else? Well, anyway, uh, Martina was talking like one hour and 20 minutes already, so I think that yeah. it's time for her <laughs> to go to, to rest. And so it's Friday, so it's, it's okay. Thanks a lot, Martina, for being here, for sharing with us all your work, but it's amazing. I like it a lot. I hope that a lot of the young students that are around here after your talk is, are thinking to, to write to you, to go to your lab and, and work there, perhaps as a or, or, or yeah. or the, but, uh, well, thanks so much for, for having me. And we are always looking for good students and even for, uh, you know, visiting students. So, yeah, just feel free to email me. <laughs> Great, well, thanks so much for having so much. me. We enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks a lot. And Bye. Bye. Bye, yeah, hope you have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Y bonito día a todos los demás también. Gracias por asistir al, al seminario. Y ve cómo se deja de transmitir en, en YouTube. Vamos.